everyone. This is Susan, and I'm here with Erica. And we, in this podcast, are discussing a sounds like a typical case of pelvic girdle pain in the pregnancy population. We put this case in there because she was really coming from somebody who had not really had good good medical care for her pregnancy and pain up to the point that she came in to see me and was in quite a bit of chronic pain and was really just trying to live with it. Um, this is a great podcast because I feel very strongly that all of us should be treating the, the pregnancy population, not just a specialized women's health group. Please go to iTunes and leave comments and questions. The other thing that we'd love for you to do is be able to rate us on iTunes. Every time we get fives, it kind of moves us up on the mark. So we hope you enjoy this and let us know your thoughts. Hey, Susan, how are you? I'm good, Erica. How are you? End of um, summer. God, the summer. You know, for me, the summer went by very quickly because I, I moved, I think. And it just sort of, I don't know, I'm kind of happy you know, to be in some fall weather, actually. Yeah, I, so. yeah we, we're very blessed in the Northeast Quadrant right now. I know. Especially after everything that happened in the Southeast. So I know, I know. Our hearts go out to them. Yes, and yes. we're thinking of you every day. Yes. Erica and I were just having a, a fun discussion, of, and we were just talking about one of the things we love about doing this podcast is it gives her and I just a scheduled opportunity to just really check in and visit about people that we have found challenging or a little bit tough to treat, and we're excited to always bring this next episode to you with the hopes that everyone out there listening um, is learning something new or thinking about something different to do with some of your clients that tend to take our emotional and physical toil sometimes <laughs> when they come into exactly. our clinic. So, I know. And I know sometimes I mean, we probably should do a podcast on something like this alone as to how to sort of protect our own energy and protect ourselves from some of these people because, you know, that's a lot of, um, you know, they're carrying a lot of emotional issues and, and, uh, you know, I, I had somebody last night who, was, who came in, it was quite late and, uh, and it was quite complicated. You know, I'm sure I'll be talking about him at some point in the podcast, but I walked out of my office two hours later and I was completely spent. So that's another topic altogether, <laughs> but that's, you know, I think that's what the beauty and, and it's, it's challenging, but it's, it's fun, you know, so um, looking forward to it. And I think, um, Susan, it's your turn to do a patient this week. And um, if anybody has any questions about any of the patients that we talked about, you know, feel free to once again, get a hold of us. Absolutely. Shoot, shoot us an email, make a comment in the comment section. We'd love to hear from you. So yes, I think we should schedule a how to take care of yourself while you're taking care of the tough to treat because we want to be healthy and energetic through our work day as well. We don't want it to be something that we're resenting or moaning about during our work life. We spend so much time at work that we want to be healthy and energized. So I'm going to launch right into yeah. my patient for this time. So um, we're going to take a little trek into something a little bit different, but it's something that I strongly believe that physical therapists, no matter what their background, if they're in the musculoskeletal world, should be able to treat the pregnant patient. And because there's so many people out there in pregnancy that are having back pain, pelvic pain, foot pain, hand pain, arm pain, neck pain, that many people are kind of like, oh, they're pregnant. I don't know what to do with that. So I don't think I should treat them. And or the patients are being told, you know, across the board that don't worry, when you have your baby, the, the pain will go away. And actually, we know from statistics and um, epidemiology that you know, if back, if back pain and pelvic pain isn't addressed in pregnancy, at least 30% of them go on to, to have a chronic pelvic or chronic back pain um, following, following pregnancy. Well, that's that's an alarming, that. that's an alarming statistic to me. And it just means that we need to care for these women when they're pregnant. They're strong, they're resilient, mm -hmm. they're not broken. They're just having musculoskeletal pain. We should be equipped to be able to treat them. Yeah, I so, had no idea the numbers were that high. Wow, that's, mm -hmm. that's crazy. 30%. Wow. Yeah. I don't, I don't see, you know, I'm glad we're talking about, about this because I don't see a lot of pregnant women. Uh, I see, you know, postpartum, but I don't see many women who are pregnant. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm going to learn something from this, this today is, for sure. <laughs> this is kind of, kind of a fun subject close to my heart to talk to. Mm -hmm. And this was an interesting one because when she came in, um, it didn't seem like this was going to be very complicated. But as it goes, as we take a history and start listening to stories, you have to, you know, find out what's really important to them and find out where you really need to work. 
So this one is a 28-year-old female who called me um, on a referral from another physical therapist. Kind of an interesting story. She is married to a hockey player who they both grew up in Pittsburgh in their home for the summer. This is where their summer home is between seasons. And mm -hmm. most, of, most of the time when they have their health care, they have it through the hockey docs. Mm -hmm. You know, because that's where they spend at least nine months of their their time, you know, with the team in the season. Um, anyway, they're back home, and he has a go-to physical therapist that he uses for his off-season training and work and, you know, to heal up any injuries from the ridiculous amount of games they play. Mm -hmm. And called him because his wife was having you know, these issues with um, back pain and hip pain. And as soon as they got back to Pittsburgh, he made the call to his physical therapist friend who said, oh, let's get you over to see, so let's get her over to see somebody who really knows how to treat this. Yeah. So yeah. she called and was all in and made an appointment and came in to see me. Um, very, you know, 28 years old, 35 weeks pregnant. Wow. So she's, you know, delivery is going to be by July 1st. Wow. So, yeah. You know, she's, <laughs> you know, and she had told me that she had been hurting since December. Wow. And is this her first pregnancy? This is or? her first, first pregnancy. First pregnancy yeah. and um, right. in pain since December. And so I just since kind of asked December. her to just wow. kind of sit back and just tell me a little bit about her story. Because um, her focus as she came in and she says, I have back pain. It's now in my pelvis. I've been told that my ligaments are too soft, that they soften too early. I have this rotation in my pelvis. So I think my pelvis is twisted. Mm. Um, and I, I just had to live with this pain. Wow. And, you know, so, and I asked her, I said, well, before we even launch into your prenatal care, you know, where were you getting your, you know, what have you been doing for your back pain? What's kind of been the story? Mm -hmm. And she said it first came on when she went to go see, a, a, she was seeing a PT for her knee and she started having some back pain that was developing. And so the PT that was seeing her for her knee said, oh, well, you have a twist in your pelvis. So they started trying to treat her for a twist in her pelvis and her back pain got worse. And then the PT was kind of like, well, you know, I think it's because you're pregnant. And I really don't know what to do. And so right oh, wow. there, she got the message that, you know, what am I going to do? There's nothing that can be done for that. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so she was also, you know, you know, getting, getting, um, she had, a, she had a bit of a, a time with a, with an OB when she first got pregnant. And so your visits are kind of, you know, far in between in the beginning, because it's not really necessary to see the doctor all that mm -hmm. often. Um, and they encouraged her to, you know, wait for her big follow up appointments till she got back to Pittsburgh. Um, because they said at that point, you'll need to establish with an OB who's going to be actually doing your delivery back home in Pittsburgh. At this point, they were in Canada. Um, but anyway, there was a long period of time that went between OB appointments, and she was just kind of relying on the, you know, doctors for the hockey team. Mm -hmm. which apparently a lot of women do that are yeah. attached to the team, which was, I found yeah. very interesting. So I told mm -hmm. her, you know, it was interesting because she was like, well, what, what's going to happen differently than the PTs that I were seeing before? And I said, well, before you were seeing people who were dedicated to the health of the elite male athlete. Yep. yep. You know, that's pretty sports specific when you've got yep. PTs that are dedicated to a hockey team. Mm -hmm. And I said, what you need is a PT that's dedicated to the women's health pregnant athlete. <laughs> that's right. you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. you know, so let's, let's take a look at things a little bit differently because you don't have ice skates on your feet and you're not, you know, playing a season. You know, what you're doing is you're getting ready for delivery and care of a, of a new human. Mm -hmm. So she talked a lot about her fears, you know, um, basically, she was really, really worried about the idea that somebody had told her that her ligaments had softened and softened too early. And so her biggest fear was, what's going to happen with labor and delivery? Um, how am I going to get through? If, if I'm having this kind of pain now, what's going to happen then? Yep. So yep. that was an interesting thing. She really almost wasn't interested in dealing with her back pain now. She mm -hmm. was like really future tripping, <laughs> really yes. worried about what she was going to do when she got yeah. there. Yeah. So a lot of the in initial piece, I just had to kind of back down and kind of go with her, um, you know, a little bit of about a trip of musculoskeletal changes in pregnancy and what we consider normal and what we consider common. And right. oftentimes back pain and pelvic pain can be common in pregnancy, but it doesn't have to be normal. Right. And it shouldn't be something that she should live with. And she had right. been doing the thing like I just was putting up with it. I was just blowing through it. Yeah. I would just do 
do things because they hurt. Yeah. And I wasn't really paying attention that there was something I could do to make it better. I tried right. to get a massage that didn't really help. It felt good at the time. You know, it feels really good if I sit quietly for a little while or if I lay, particularly lay on my right side, it feels mm -hmm. better. But yep. every time I go to move, it starts to hurt again. Right. And so and she was just really feeling stuck. Yeah. And her, so the OB never really referred her for any kind of physiotherapy, right? I mean, do you find that that's common in that population? I do find that it's common in the population. Many yeah. times they'll just tell them that, and not, I'm not trying to throw the OBs under the bus at all. Yeah, yeah. And they just haven't had great success with PT, except right. in certain areas where they have a go-to PT that they know about that yeah, yeah. will actually do it. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's, just, it's still a matter of education on our part with yep. physicians about what we can do. We're not just going to, um, you know, rub their back and put some heat on them and, and give them two exercises that we really are going to look at them from mm -hmm. top to bottom and help them begin to understand how they can get some variance in their postures and they can get some variance in their movement patterns that will take them out of their painful postures and painful movement patterns that they're yep. kind of stuck in. Mm -hmm. um, it's always been kind of the human experience that when we, we lay down movement patterns, we kind of continue to move in those patterns, even if they're painful. Yes. And so so yeah. sometimes it's like, we just need to teach her a new way to move. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. before I could even get her attention to change that, I needed to um, help her understand what was going on. Yeah. yeah so I that mean, she, she would not feel worried. So we spent a lot of time talking about what was good. You know, that she's strong, yeah. she's resilient, her pregnancy has been going beautifully. Mm -hmm. She doesn't have any blood pressure problems. You know, she's been eating well. Things are good. You know, she's a very strong, resilient, you know, those young are, lady. Yeah, those are the Sims. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> me, right? Exactly, <laughs> Sims. Perfect. Yeah. And the, 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 you know, the Dems are what's going to yeah. happen to me. Yeah. You yeah, know, I mean, yeah. really, she was so focused on that, that future tripping, you know, that she, you know, this, you know, addressing her symptoms right away wasn't going to get her to keep her coming in the door. I needed to address yeah. what was what she was really, really worried about. Yeah. So we talked a little bit. I said, there are things that you can do in labor and delivery, and we'll focus on those. You know, we'll focus on what are the best positions? What can you do? What is the, you know, how can you change and move around in labor and delivery so that you feel like you know you're protected and you're strong and you can do this and so once I could kind of get her on the boat to understanding that she didn't have to number one put up with the pain number two she didn't need to be worried about positional pain and making her pain worse through labor and mm -hmm. delivery and yep. number three that if we can begin to change things now it's going to make your postpartum um, peace even better yeah yeah. And she's going to have some good information. And I encouraged her to, you know, she, she had already signed up for, um, you know, the pregnancy classes that you go to with your husband, mm -hmm. where they teach you a little bit about what's going to happen in labor and delivery and the breathing yeah. and those pieces. And, you know, then she started even asking more questions like, well, what if I decided to bring my husband in so that he could be part of this and see kind of what I'm doing too? I said, that, that's perfect. Mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, you need to gather your support system around you and be able to have those things. Because again, she's 35 weeks. So yeah. This little event could happen at any point. <laughs> we'd, love, we'd love for her to wait till 40, at least 40 weeks, right? Because right. the longer yeah. they cook, the better. But, yeah. um, you know, you know first, first babies, everybody often thinks they come early. They usually don't. They usually come later. Yeah. Um, you know, and she's still got some moving and changing to go. So we talked a little bit about the rapid growth process and yeah. how that can begin to affect, you know, just certain things that she does that, you know, I said, the way that you move isn't bad. It's just that you're only moving in certain ways all the time. Right, and, right. you know, your body is changing. So yep. perhaps maybe some of your movement strategies could change too. And, right. you know, get that going just a little bit better so that you feel like you have, you're able to change in the moment if something's hurting, you can change the way that you move to make it to something that isn't going to be as painful. Right. It's almost like with these types of patients, you have to think on the fly a lot more often mm -hmm. because with the, all the hormonal changes they're having, mm -hmm. they're, they're the potential, you know, sources or causes of their issues can change along with them. So one day it could be this, the next day it could be this. So to have someone who's experienced with that population, especially when they've had such a, you know, a, a long, you know, many months of back pain, it, you know, you need to be able to change with them and make quick, 
not quick decisions, but you need to make sound clinical Mm decision-making, you know, and not just keep doing the same thing because this person's changing in front of you. And if you don't change with them, then, you know, you you know, the the, thou two shall never meet in the end, you know, (laughs) and that's, that's, I love it. That's beautifully put because they really literally are changing weekly. And particularly when they get into the last trimester, it's all baby growth along with massive hormonal changes because everything is getting ready now for the big event. Yeah. And, you know, but the, the, the rapid growth of the baby moving straight out in front of the body, there has to be postural adaptations to that. That's just, it's normal. Otherwise yeah. we're going to be pulled over onto our face. Yeah. So, you know, being able to get her to be able to adapt quicker too was, you know, I felt like the key, but I needed to get her First of all, I needed to get the buy-in. So helping her with her beliefs about labor and delivery and that she had support, people, resources, understanding was, was key. So that was the good piece. Once she started to settle down about that, then she was able to kind of start talking about what was going on with her pain. And it was very interesting because it was all or nothing that she would focus on. I either have this, all this pain all the time or I can be here quiet and have no pain until I have it. And then it's all this pain all the time. So she wasn't listening to anything different. Mm -hmm. She wasn't able to scale. Well, it's not as bad if I do this, but it's a little worse if I do this, but this is better. And that, you know, she was unable to kind of feel that it was an Mm -hmm. all or nothing response, Mm -hmm. um, which I think is a part of that kind of just diving and pressing through it and, yeah, she called it, her words were soldiering on. Right. (laughs) Right. Right. And I think, People, people do think that they have, they, 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 they need to live with pain. Um, mm-hmm. And that is, you know, maybe a belief, maybe it's perpetuated by society, but you don't have to live with pain. Exactly. And, you know, and, and that's. And you have a pain experience, but let's figure out a way to change that pain experience. Exactly. So that you know when you're moving back into it or when you're moving away from it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Being able to feel that. So it was interesting because generally my exam and a lot of people's exam with pregnancy is to look at the musculoskeletal system, do some of the normal things we would all do. Um, I think a lot of people probably would maybe look in standing and kind of see may, maybe a bending over or not, you know, extension, side mm-hmm. bending, those things. But generally, I think when people see pelvic pain and pregnancy or back pain, they want to immediately run to those lumbar special tests and those pelvic girdle special tests mm-hmm. and put a belt on them. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, and, that, and that's yeah. a, a bit yeah. of what that is what the evidence shows. So yeah. I actually took, I had her fill out the pelvic girdle pain questionnaire, which is validated on pregnancy and postpartum later. Oh, Yep. Um, and it's got some, what I like about this particular questionnaire is it's got some really good functional movements in there. Yep. And they asked them to grade those functional movements as to what they can do and what they can't do. And it was interesting, her history was an all or nothing. Yeah. So, was the, so was the pelvic girdle questionnaire. But the cool thing was she really had to pick out the specific events that were like the ones that she graded the highest. Yeah. So I could really yeah. see what was really the big things that were bothering her. Interesting. Now, is that a specific questionnaire you made or is that one that people can get generally? No, that's one that people can get. And, and I'll, actually put, I'll actually put the link on yeah. the show notes. Okay. For the pelvic, it's called the pelvic girdle pain questionnaire. Perfect. And it's full access. Yeah. Anyone can get it and use it. Um, and like I said, it's, um, you know, it's, it's validated for pregnancy and postpartum. Mm-hmm. And the, the, the link to it, I'll put in the show notes, but there's also mm-hmm. the um, clinical practice guidelines for, pel- for pelvic girdle pain in the pregnancy population. Mm-hmm. And the draft of that is on the Sectional Women's Health website. Ah, got and it. that's going to be coming out in publication this summer with the oh, Journal of Women's Health PT. So, oh, nice. The, yeah, so the stats on that pelvic gir- girdle pain questionnaire is on there. You know, it's funny. I um, I have to renew my membership to the APTA this 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 uh this this month, and I think um I've never been a, wem- a member of the Women's Health, so I think I actually am going to do that this year. We would love to have you. I will. Yes, I will be joining. <laughs> anyway, I digress. So anyway. That's okay. These are good things. But yeah. it's, I, think, I think sometimes when we look at all of these questionnaires and these outcome measures and all of these things, we almost become numb to them because, mm-hmm. you know, okay, the Oswestry, okay, the neck disability index. So, yeah. you know, but sometimes if you, what I like to do with those is I like to look at those to help me develop 
what's important to the patient because it gives me just more information. Mm -hmm. And with her, it was really kind of nice because it matched up exactly with what she was really worried about. Yeah. Yeah, that's the great. The things that she was telling me were the things that she had marked on the paper. Yeah. When you see the discrepancy, that's when you can get in and kind of question a little bit. Well, mm-hmm. here you really indicated that this was a big problem. Yep. Well, maybe it's not as big of a problem as I thought when I filled that out. You know, so you uh, kind of start that conversation, yep. you know, but um, that, yep. I love them for that because that kind of just helps me go, oh, but wait a second. What about this? We had talked about, you had talked about this on the, on the questionnaire, but you didn't talk about it in your history. So yeah, tell yeah, me a little yeah. bit more about that. So oh, kind of yeah. bring some more information in that way. Yep. So I decided to move a little bit differently with her. Mm-hmm. She was really having a lot of trouble standing, prolonged standing, walking, prolonged walking. The walking and the prolonged walking was what really brought her pubic symphysis issues on. Mm-hmm. Prolonged standing really brought on her posterior pelvic pain issues and some pain because she would like grab both sides of her hips Mm -hmm. and you know she goes after a while it just felt like I was in a vice here on both sides of my hips so um, I looked to those things as the initial piece of course moving in bed is always a big one and yeah. um, getting in and out of a chair and yep. up and down from the floor. Yep. So all of those transitional movements, but I just felt like let's just start with standing, but let's do it in a little bit of a non-traditional way. Let's yep. try to see if we can't get her in standing and right away, I love the PT assess and treat, assess and treat, assess and treat, because mm-hmm. we kind of do it all the time anyway. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. So, so she like, had pain, I'm sorry, so she had yes. right, pain right at the pubic symphysis as well as in the, right. the posterior, mm-hmm. okay, got it. And so, you know, with the, with the pelvic girdle pain, um, you know, there's two bodies of evidence that have looked at that. One kind of classified it with Albert et al. And then Cook et al. came in and kind of looked at their classification and even narrowed it down to testing that would be the most sensitive and specific. Mm-hmm. And they found that pointing to the pubic symphysis was as good as any test you could do. Oh, wow. That's as long great. As an important sign to the yep, SI yep, joint. Yep. And then also the idea of doing a single leg stance or a lunge. So a simple load transfer test. Yes. If it recreated that familiar pain in and yep. around the pelvis, hips, or low back, yep. that, that was really specific and sensitive too. And better than doing all of those cluster Special tests. Test. Yep. So... Yep. She's up and standing. I've got her. She's already pointed. So let's do a couple of those tests. So we did some load transfers. Oh, nice. To see. So I had her stand on one leg and, you know, and had her stand on the other leg. And although she was wobbly, when she stood on the right leg, that did tend to increase her symptoms. When she stood mm-hmm. on the left leg, not as much. So right away, I was getting her to tell the difference. You know, yep. this is different than that. Can mm-hmm. you feel the difference? Those types of things. And then we did some simple lunges. Mm-hmm. And those brought on things you know all around the pelvis you know both directions the mm-hmm. same mm-hmm. so right away we started working on how can we change this yeah how can you do that simple lunge and not have it hurt and I just had her play around with you know I gave her a couple of ideas I said try it turning your foot in slightly tie it turning mm-hmm. your foot outside. try going in a diagonal try a couple of things so she started kind of beginning to play with movement and By doing that, I'm still assessing, but she's also actually beginning to learn that if I move in a different way, I can change my experience. So she got to where she could actually do a three quarters of a lunge on both sides without symptoms. And we're five, oh, minutes wow. in, we're five minutes into the treatment. How did she change? <laughs> so all she did, all she did, she just, she, you know, I just told her, I said, you know, kind of think about widening your stance, bringing it in, turning your foot in and out, maybe taking a, yeah, yeah, about, yeah. Maybe taking a smaller. And I let her play with it. Yep, and yep. I just talked to her about, you know, just feel the difference. It's, you know, this and this, mm-hmm, and it's not that mm-hmm. this is bad or this is good. And she was kind of laughing a little bit because she was mm-hmm. moving. I think it was because she just felt like she was safe. Yeah, yeah. And so she, and when she was able to actually lunge, she was so excited. Yeah, that's thought, awesome. I didn't think I could ever do this. Yeah. And I said, it, what do you think is the difference? So I did ask her, I said, what do you think is the difference? And she goes, I think I just feel like I, I can do it. I feel like I have confidence to do it. Right. And yeah, because I, it's, I think we talked about this one 
the first podcast about changing people's center of mass and, mm -hmm. you know, a base of support, wide stance, narrow stance. And people don't realize because it's the same motor pattern that they have. Like I'll use myself as, as an example. I'm way over on my right leg a, a lot. And when I, when I shift my center of mass over it, you realize, oh, you know, I, I can do certain things better when I change, you know, make some just postural adjustments. And I think people really, you know, how to, to do that themselves, but they're, they don't do it because they're either not cute or they don't feel safe or they don't know or they think it'll make them worse. And, 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 and I really think that, you know, I benefited just by listening to different ways that, that you have changed people's, you know, just stances in, in, in straight sort of sagittal plane type tests. And then even with these lunges and, and I always play with the center of mass, but I love the changing the base of support, whether it's a stride stance, a wide stance. And um, I, that's great. I'm just, I'm all for that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it was just nice to have her, you know, get the confidence. And, and I'll tell you the, you know, the old Susan would have immediately probably put a belt on her, yep. you know, and yep. given her the stability that way. But what I really wanted, what I'm really changing my approach and what I'm really wanting to do is empower the patient to be able, if, if I can get them doing a lot of things without a support system, I want to do it because I know that even though they feel better with a belt, they're right. only likely to wear it under certain circumstances because yep. it's a, a little bit of a hassle to put on. You can't sit in it, yep. you know, and then you have to spend a lot of time trying on a whole bunch of other different, you know, apparatus for pregnancy. She wasn't having the kind of pain that I felt like her whole abdomen needed to be lifted up. Yeah. Um, and here's how I kind of figured that out. As she was doing some of her things, I said, okay, let's just go back to regular standing now. And I had her just do some easy sways and kind of just feel how that could feel and how she could change that up. And she could feel muscles turn on and turn off as she was doing that. And so all I did was I just came in behind her and I just lifted her, you know, right underneath her abdomen, lifted the baby up just slightly. Mm -hmm. And I said, does that feel any different, you know, than you doing this way? And go ahead and do your lunge, feel how that feels. I came in and supported it, let her do her lunge again. It really, she felt okay either way. So I just didn't feel like right now we needed to like spend a lot of time trying to lift the abdomen up. Right. Her right. belly is strong. She's got good tension and control through there you know so I just said you know this is not I, I'm going to try to avoid support as much as possible for her I didn't want to right. feed into that see everything so soft and fragile you right, have to belt right. it up right, um, right, right. May have, we may go there in a couple of weeks I don't know but right yeah. now she was able to get herself out of pain she was able to stand she was able to lunge and then we went into some squatting and some bending over mm -hmm. functional movements and so she learned a different way to squat and a different way to move and then we took it, it into sit, sit, you know, and your, your big thing that I love yes. is that sit to stand and watching the head. Yeah. Because <laughs> you know, I, I love, you know, that was just so much fun when we did that the other day on the podcast, because I've yeah. gone back and done that with a number of my patients. And it's so cool because, you know, I haven't really like looked at the head as much as kind yeah. of what they're doing at the trunk, you know, pelvic floor focus a little bit. Yeah. Um, and it's so, because it's like waving a flag. I know. <laughs> you know, because the base is there. It's like, well, what's happening up above, above that kind of thing? And it was like, oh, my goodness, look at that. Yeah, so I yeah. watched her head. I used your cue, and I said, let's watch her head. And so she, you know, was going in. And st instead of focusing on her back, her pelvis, her hips, I used what I call my new Erica uh, Melo trick is I was just like, <laughs> where's your head? Here's center. Just yeah. let's stand up and sit down. Tell me where your head is. And she was knocking over you oh, know, into my hand the whole time. And it was oh, like wow, such, crazy. A, such an eye opener for her though, to see how much she was really tilting her, you know, kind of yeah. doing things a little bit different. Yeah. So I just had her focus on her head. Yeah. And, you oh, know, I said, can you move your head in space while you're doing this? Move it away from where it's going. See if you can do it by moving it over the other way. She got busy doing that, and of course, then she wasn't having any pain with her hand, which was like, yay! Of course, yay! It was, it was just, I have to tell you, talk about taking care of yourself when you treat these tough people. Oh, my God. When you have people laughing who were crying 15 minutes ago, yep. you know, and, and you're having fun because the creative process is coming out. Mm -hmm. And you're willing to look at things a little bit differently yeah. and change up the old exam thing. Yes. Then you yes. can really start to have a good time. So yeah. within 30 minutes, I had her standing, squatting, lunging, sit to stand, oh. doing the, you know, getting things off the floor. We actually threw the shoes down and some stuff. So she had something to like pick up. 
Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so we were able to, you know, move through those things. So then the final thing was looking at the exam with her getting in and out of bed. Mm-hmm. And I think at this point, um, that was another big piece of what I looked at and then into the interventions that we'll do um, that I that I did with her and kind of how that all turned out. I was just saying that, you know, I think we're always trying to do add new and novel, you know, movements into the patient's nervous system. And I think just a different way of assessing, you know, is new and novel. And the mm-hmm. fact that you got her to develop her own strategy for squatting, for lunging, for standing, uh, getting in on a bed, things like that, that's therapeutic in and of itself, the assessment, right? And 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 the fact that you can affect a change that quickly, right? So exactly. we've talked about this before, and it, it's and 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 people just are like, well, if then it's not my stiff joint or it's not my, you know, tight muscle. Well, at the end of the day, things are driving strategies. But if you can make a change that quickly, it. it it really gets that buy-in. And with somebody like that, I mean, you got a lot done in that evaluation. I mean, that's a lot, you know, <laughs> which, is, which is great. But as you're, if, if you're finding, did you find that did she, with each functional movement, was it a similar change she had to make or did she, did she make different changes? Well, what was interesting was the lunges and the squats and the bend overs were similar. Yep. And to me, I probably could have transferred that over to sit to stand, mm-hmm. but I wanted to look at sit to stand just a little bit differently. Got it. Uh, and I'm yeah. not sure why I got there. Part, part of it was probably just being a little bit of influenced by, well, Erica's done this. I'm going to give that a try. But, yeah. the, you know, we had focused so much already on the back of the pelvis and she got yeah. that and she yeah. was feeling good. And I thought, let's do this a little bit different so she can begin to feel something above that pelvis and feel those connections right up right. above and kind of how that's happening it just yep. seemed important to start to bring in other parts of her body yeah yeah so i loved looking at the head yep. because when you're moving in space like that you know mm-hmm. squat is a little different than a sit down stand up mm-hmm. and i think it's because of how you're transferring your load back to the chair and back up versus a straight down squat or right. one hand on your knee and, and bend down and pick something up it's mm-hmm. just you know and with pregnancy there's a tendency to fall yep uh, we have a high risk of fall in the seventh month on and it's a forward post it's an anterior posterior sway yep. so i just felt like you know pulling that together and then you know thinking about the head i thought wonder what that head is doing yep. and so i just was looking at that observationally not even thinking i was going to do anything yep. therapeutic with it and it just turned out it was like this is the cue yep. <laughs> this is well, you know it's you interesting. Know? <laughs> it's, it, absolutely and you know you know just to, to re- recap a little bit it's interesting mm-hmm. it, it, you did not mention that she was pregnant okay mm-hmm. you would see this type of evaluation you could do on, 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 on anybody really. Exactly. Exactly. I, and you just added the fact that she was pregnant and you, you modified a few things, but that's the beauty of an assessment like that because you can do it with whatever population. Right. You know? And this is something anybody can do. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Exactly. You, exactly. Yeah, you know, you can read and learn a little bit about pregnancy and the things in the red flags easy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, to find and pay attention to and, you know, get that information. Yeah. But, these people are are still straight up and down musculoskeletal exactly. people. And, yes. you know, the, the stuff that works for your chronic back pain or your yep. hip pain or your knee pain or your foot pain is the stuff that, you know, you're going to do on this population. It's just some modifications. Yep. And, you know, yep. kind of understanding a little bit that this is that rapid growth of the belly. Right. And that they're going to change every week, you know. Yep. And I think that the cognitive barrier with a population like this is sometimes our own cognitive barriers because yeah. we – you know, as therapists, sometimes get very nervous about treating a Mm -hmm. a pregnant woman, you know, and you're like, if it's her first child, what happens? But I think we have to work on ourselves a little bit with populations like that. Get over yourself, you know, Mm -hmm. it's, you know, and you showed that beautifully in this assessment. So, and I think we, we can help these people and Mm -hmm. we don't want to give the impression that they can live with pain or they should live with pain because they're Mm -hmm. pregnant because that is certainly not the case. And if we view them a little bit differently, you know, differently as in the sense that you're pregnant versus you're a human being who has back pain, that changes your whole perspective on the person, right? So Absolutely. I think it's one of those things, one of my favorite quotes is, and I don't even know who said it, um, argue for your patient's limitations and they're theirs. 
Yep. You Love know, it. argue for your patient's expectations and it's theirs. So, mm -hmm. you know, when we, like you said, I love, you know, if, if it's our hang up, make sure it doesn't become their hang up. Yep. Exactly. You, know, if you need to inform yourself, inform yourself. There's so many resources out there. Mm -hmm. And I'll put some of those resources into the show notes as well as the pelvic Perfect. girdle pain questionnaire. Yeah. Um, that's so awesome. people can read quickly, you know, on what they need to kind of watch out for and some myth busting and stuff like that. With that, we're going to sign off on part one of this particular podcast on so Tough to Treat. We'll pick up next time with uh, where we went with the rest of the exam and, and how the interventions have gone and see what your thoughts are then on that. So okay. this is Susan Clinton and Erica Mello, enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs> Have a great day. <laughs> okay, bye. bye.